your following message from Redbud Baptist Church. Redbud Baptist Church is located at 801 Slide Road in Lubbock, Texas. We have two worship services on Sunday, 9 a.m. worship traditional, which is called Traditions, and then a more modern worship at 11, 11 a.m., which you like to call Bridge. Join us anytime. We're a growing church, growing disciples. Enjoy the message. I was in an auto shop yesterday trying to purchase some parts for one of my vehicles and as I uh, showed the gentleman the part that I was looking for, um, he looked at it and just kind of sat there for a second. He said, what does this belong to? (laughs) And uh, I told him the name of the vehicle and the year of the vehicle and where it went and all of that. And immediately, without even blinking or batting an eye, he said, how much do you want for it? (laughs) And I said, well, it's not for sale. And, uh, but as we begin to talk about uh, the part and we discuss with each other, he said, um, I, uh, I miss that. He said, I, uh, I spent 15 years with my father remodeling cars. He said it was my life for 15 years. He said, I learned the trade from my father. My father and I were not just co-workers, owned the shop together. He said, he was my friend. He taught me everything that I know. And he said this, He said, the day came when my father looked at me and he said, son, I've taught you everything that I know. And he said, there's nothing more I can teach you. And in fact, he said, you have become better than I ever was. I share that story with you because we wonder what's wrong with our society why we have the struggles that we have. And I want to tell you that in part the reason that we do is because we have fewer fathers like that man. There's an organization, I, I really don't know how to pronounce the, the name of it, so I, I butchered it earlier this, this uh, morning, but I, um, they did a... a a joint study, I think, with uh, Barna Group, and uh, on the subject of <clears throat> the problems in our society and what's wrong with uh, uh, why we, we as a nation, why Christianity is losing its uh, grip on this nation, if you will. And uh, some of the conclusions that they come up with are really alarming, really, really stunning. But they concluded that the reason... Uh, that, that this happened is, is what we all know, uh, and that is the demise of the family, the demise of the family. But, but the second part of that study was, was very interesting to me. The study concluded that not only is it the demise of the family, but they said that the uh, fatherless homes in our society are the biggest factor in why we are where we are. Absentee fatherism is, or the lack thereof, is why we are in the society that we are in today. I mentioned to them just uh, uh, earlier that uh, there's a school close by, a school district nearby. As you hear things that happen in school district earlier, we heard a few weeks ago, we heard about a school district having some problems with something that supposedly went on in the school, and I'm not here to debate that or, or to, to affirm it or, or disclaim it. But in the, in the discussion and in the, the goings-on of the, the issue at their school, there was a, a group of people who were involved in speaking out uh, on the issue and trying to, to get a handle on what was going on in the school district. And as I watched and as I heard uh, what was going on, I noticed something interesting. 
I noticed that the majority of the people speaking out, whether it was before the school board or whether it was on social media or whether it was directly with the principal at the school, whatever it may have been, the, the biggest group of people speaking out in favor of protecting the children was the women. The women were the ones speaking up. The women were the ones standing up. The women were the ones being bold. And as I examined the groups and the social media and all of that stuff, I noticed something very interesting. In some of those cases, the fathers were nowhere to be found. In some of those cases, the father was around and didn't say a word. The silence of men in our nation is astounding. I'm not here to scold anybody. I'm not here to to make you feel bad. I am here this morning with this message to encourage you. If the men of this nation won't speak out, I don't care what we try to do. We're not going to save anything. If the men refuse, for whatever reason, fear, intimidation, worry of loss, if we don't speak up, we're done for as a nation. Ladies, thank you very much for what you do. But there's absolutely no way you can carry this issue on your own. I don't care what the world says. And I don't care what they try to tell us. A pastor preaching on the passage that I am going to preach on this morning in his sermon brought out some startling statistics that I want to read with you before we get to this text. Pastor Ace Davis in preaching on 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, which is our text for today, listed these statistics, and I want to read those to you now. He quoted, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 18.3 million children, that's one in four, live without a biological step or adoptive father in the home. 18.3 children. 85% of youth who are currently in prison grew up in a fatherless home. Girls who live in a fatherless home have a higher risk of suffering from obesity than girls who have their father present. Teen girls from fatherless homes are also four times more likely to become mothers before the age of 20. 63% of youth suicides involve a child who is living in a fatherless home when they made their final decision. 85% of children which exhibit some type of behavioral issue come from a fatherless home. And then he asks his congregation this question. Now, does that sound like a society that's heading in the right direction? I don't know about you, but if those statistics are true, there's no way that we could argue that that's a society headed in the right, wrong direct, or right direction. We're headed down the wrong path, and we're headed down the wrong path fast. There is a person who could stand in the way and stop it. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. The title of today's message is this, Traits of a Godly Father, or Characteristics of a Godly Father. And the passage of Scripture is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. So I'm going to invite you to go there. And as you get there, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to read God's Word. And then uh, I'll share with you today's message. Paul, writing to the Thessalonian church, wrote these words. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how devoutly, righteously, and blamelessly we conducted ourselves with you believers. As you know, like a father with his own children... We encouraged, comforted, and implored each one of you to live worthy of God 
who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And Father, I thank you for this word. Now I pray, Lord, that this passage of Scripture would speak to us and that the principles that are found here in this letter to this church written by Paul, the apostle, I pray that those principles, Lord, would stand out and you would speak to us concerning them. And I pray, Lord, for every man in this room, I pray, Lord, that these things would be true as I look out into our congregation. Father, I see many of them who have been great and godly fathers. But Lord, if there's any one of us faltering in any of these areas, I pray, Father, that today you would convict us in our heart. I pray, Lord, that you would help us because it's never too late. And Lord, if you are in it, it's certainly never too late. And so I pray that you speak to us and to the audience watching here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Before my father passed away <clears throat> several years ago, he sat me down and probably did my brother and may have done my sisters as well. And I wouldn't be surprised if he even spoke to my uh, brothers-in-law. But to me, he said two things, and he said them to me in Spanish, and I'm going to say them to you, and then I'll translate. Most of you are probably going to understand what he said. He said to me, whatever you do, he said, cuida tu familia. And then his last words to me were, cuida a tu mamá. Take care of your family. Take care of your mother. Many of you have heard me share bits of my testimony about my father and our relationship. <clears throat> I won't go into that today, but just to tell you that I've never forgotten that advice from my father as he laid in his uh, bed shortly before he passed away. And I've always taken that to heart, and I've always known that that's my responsibility. Many of you men who are sitting here today, you've always known that that's your responsibility, and many of you have done a great job. Many of you have raised your families, and you've taught them well, and they're, and they're on their way. That doesn't mean that you raised perfect children. That just means that you raised sinners who needed Jesus, and you did everything in your, in your power to teach them and train them and equip them. But I'm here to tell you that there are not enough of us men like that. And so I'm here to encourage all of us today to do just what Paul is talking about to these Christians. In several places in the New Testament, Paul refers to him, to him of himself as a father to these, these people, these believers. He was their spiritual father. He had met, probably led many of them to the Lord. Um, and then he was a father to men like Timothy and his missionary team and those people that surrounded him. He was a father to them. And so he is speaking here not just as an apostle, but he's speaking here as if a father were speaking to his children uh, in this letter. And there are some characteristics that are important in the life of Paul that he discusses here that are important and are traits and characteristics in the life of a godly man and a godly father. And I want to give those to you this morning. And I want you to think about these, and I want you to dwell on, on, on some of these. And if there's any area in your life this morning that any of these are, uh, you fall short or, or not present, then, then I would pray to you, men, I would ask you to, to take this to the Lord and get on your knees before God and ask Him to lead you in this direction and make you a godly father, make you a godly man because they're so desperately needed. By the way, those of us who have raised our children and are already gone, let me tell you something, men. There are young men around us that need our help. They need your wisdom. They need your ability. They need your, your understanding, your skills. They, they, they need that. They desperately need that because many of them have had no guide for a long time. And you could be... Uh, an encourager. So let me give you these words that Paul mentions here. I want you to notice first, in verse 10, Paul says, you are witnesses, and so is God. Now let me stop there just for a second. Here is a man who is not concerned about what people think about him. In fact, it's the opposite. He has witnesses to his conduct. 
He is able to produce people that he associated with that can describe him without him having to say a word. That's a pretty, that's a pretty good thing. When people can speak about who you are and what you are, and you don't have to toot your own horn, that's an amazing thing. That says something about a person. And Paul says, I have witnesses, and so is God, my witness, of how devoutly, righteously, and blamelessly we conducted ourselves with you believers. Paul's not tooting his own horn. He's not claiming perfection. He's not... He's not talking about an an error-free preacher or an error-free pastor or any of those things. He's simply describing his conduct before other believers. And it's an amazing thing when a man can sit in front of a crowd or talk to people or anyone and talk about his character and who he is in a positive way. We need men like that. We need men like that. We need men like that to speak up. And so the first word that I want to give you is that this is a characteristic and a trait of a godly father. The integrity of a godly father is important. Integrity is those principles and those morals that make up who he is and how he lives and how he conducts himself. And if there were ever a time when we need men of integrity, it is today. And if, you, and if you are, not by the tooting of your own horn, but others would attest to who you are, if you are a man of integrity, then, sir, I would say to you that you need to stand up, not to be seen, but you need to stand up, and you need to be a man of integrity in our society today. Those young men desperately need men of integrity. Over my lifetime of uh, schooling, uh, especially in the high school time, I had all kinds of coaches who shaped not only my athleticism, but who I was. And I can tell you that there were some coaches that I would have never listened to the way they conducted themselves and the way they carried themselves. They were not godly men. But over my time in high school and, and, and around others, I have seen the godly coaches who have invested their lives in young men. And those are the guys who come up and say something like, yeah, we play football, and yeah, we work out, and we do all those things, but we use these things as tools to teach these young men how to conduct themselves and how to have a life after all this is over. We need men of integrity. And we need men of integrity who will stand up and say so and to live out your life Live it in front of people, not for show, not for any of that, but so that somebody can turn to you and say, how do you live like that? How do you conduct yourself like that? And here's an important question. Somebody, somebody said one time that, that I don't know which generation they were referring to, Z, A, B, X, I don't know. But they said that the biggest question that some of these young people want a- a- answered is Why? Why? You remember those days when your children said, you tell them something and they would say, why? Why? And they would annoy you to no end with the word why. You know what why means? Why means purpose. Why do you, why do you live like that? Why aren't you like the rest of them? Why don't you practice that stuff? Why are you different? I was at the Starbucks, or actually at the United the other day, right over here, and I showed up early to meet with the men who are, are having the, the, the uh, discipleship and, and devotional time. And uh, I don't always attend, but I showed up there. I took my daughters to the airport early in the morning, and I had time, so I was hungry, and I grabbed a, a burrito and a uh, uh, cup of that expensive Starbucks coffee that I rarely buy, but I, but I went over there and bought it anyway because I wanted one and and as I was standing in line the young man said to me he said uh, uh, what is your day going to be like today sir uh, you have a full day and I said oh yeah he said well what, what are you what are you going to do and I said well today is the day that I finalize my message and my sermon and when I said sermon his eyes got this big and he just kind of he said well I guess that would be quite a day 
And uh, he said, what are, what, where do you pastor a church? And I told him the name of the church. And, uh, and I just immediately said, and where do you go to church? And I mean, his whole demeanor just changed. It's like, well, you know. But I could tell that the young man needed some encouragement. And I said, well, why don't you come visit us? Why don't you come by our church? And I began to strike up a conversation. Why do I tell you that story? I tell it to you because that's how simple and easy it is to strike up a conversation with somebody. It's not that complicated. We just got to slow down enough to be willing to care enough to speak to people. We need men of integrity. But let me give you something else. Men, take this to heart. Not only do we need men of integrity, not only is, is integrity a trait of a godly father, but so is instruction. Instruction is a trait or a characteristic of a godly father. You see, I've known men who point their finger and say, go do this and go do that. But never cared enough to show interest to see if they even do it or not. Or if they even did it right or not. It was more of, go do this, and when I get back, it better be done. I've, I've, known, I've known more men like that than, than this kind of man that I'm about to describe you. The kind of man who would take a young man, a young boy, or like I said, a young man, and take him by the hand, so to speak, and show him, I want you to do this, and this is why I want you to do it, and this, how, and this is how we need to get it done, and so forth, and then come back and inspect the instruction. What I'm trying to tell you is there is a difference between someone who tells somebody what to do, and somebody who instructs somebody on what to do and why to do. Men, I want to tell you, we, we can assume all we want, but there are young fathers out there, young men out there who are not fathers who need to know from you how to do it and why to do it. We may be assuming that they know, but many of them do not. If they grew up in a fatherless home, do you think they got any fatherly instruction? No. Very few of them do. When you read the New Testament and you read Paul, you see the amount of instruction that he gave to Timothy, to others in his mission team, and on and on as he traveled. He was a man who instructed these men and others on what to do. What we lack in our society and what we lack in our Churches is men who are willing to take the experiences of their lives and pour them into other people, especially other young men. By the way, that's just another way of describing discipleship. Too many times we describe discipleship as sitting around a Bible study group with open Bibles and having a discussion or reading somebody else's book on whatever it is that the subject may be on that book, and we call that discipleship. That's not discipleship. That may be Bible, gaining Bible knowledge. That may be learning something from somebody, but that's not discipleship. Discipleship is taking somebody with you everywhere you go and teaching them what you know, but more importantly, showing them what you know. That's discipleship. Jesus walked everywhere he went. And everywhere he walked, the twelve were with him. They were in the temple. They were in a home. They were on the street. They were on the beach. They were in every location you can manage, imagine. And everywhere that Jesus was, his disciples were. You say, Pastor, that's not practical. Yes, it is. For too long, we've been told that that's not practical, that that can't happen. Sylvia and I were talking just the other day about the men who, the pastors who poured into her life and my life and the time that they took to invest in our lives. And I can, I can attest to you, and Sylvia would attest, that, that those men, by their behavior and by their actions and by how they invested in our lives, made sure or had a heavy hand in 
we being a successful marriage and a successful family and growing and all that kind of stuff. Because people poured into our, into our lives. Godly men are men of instruction. They're men of integrity. But let me give you another word. Godly fathers are men of inspiration. Inspiration. Listen to what Paul says to this group of people. Not only does he talk about his conduct among them, but this is how he describes his relationship to them. As you know, like a father with his own children, we encouraged and comforted. We encouraged and comforted. Men, can I tell you something? There are men out there and young men out there who simply need encouragement. Encouragement. This week I received a text from a gentleman that I was asking if he would consider to come and lead our worship service. And I got the message and earlier in the week he had said, let me, let me look at my calendar. And I didn't hear from him all week until late yesterday. And this is in part the message that I got. I won't be able to help you with your worship service. Because since my retirement, I have lost the desire to do it anymore. Church, can I tell you something? In this society, it's easy to lose your desire. It's easy to lose the will. It's disheartening, it's discouraging, right? But I don't know if encouragement will do it or not, but what I'm trying to tell you is that some people out there just need encouragement. They need to be encouraged, they need to be lifted up. And so I hope I'm not just coming across as, as uh, uh, making you feel guilty or anything. I'm trying to encourage you, men. You need, to, you need to find a young man or young men out there and encourage them. Encourage them. Comfort. I'm not talking about going over there and holding their hands like you would a little child, but there are some men up there who are having some struggles in life and they need comfort. They need reassurance. Hey, things are going to go well. Things are going to be good. That's a good opportunity to say to them, how's your relationship with Christ? How is your relationship with God? Where do you stand with that? I promise you, men, most of these guys will say something like, well, I'm not really sure, or I haven't been there in a long time, or I haven't been in church in a while. All these answers are perfect opportunities. Let me tell you something that I told the, the, the men at discipleship the other day. I said, have you ever noticed in the New Testament that you know, Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. And he did. But have you ever noticed in the New Testament that almost everyone that Jesus dealt with were not people that Jesus directly went to? As if he was searching them by name or by you know, the, the, may, there may be a few others, but the one that comes to my mind that comes the closest to maybe Jesus making a beeline for him just because of the way it's worded in John is Zacchaeus. When Jesus said to him, come down off of that tree because today I must go to your house. That's about as close as I think there is. Do you realize that the majority of the people that, that, came, that, that were involved with Jesus are people that were, that were drawn to Jesus by what they heard? and who he is. Do you realize that when we talk about go into the world and make disciples is less about you making a beeline directly to some individual or some ethnic group or something as much as is you and I going out there being involved in the world and as you are guess what's going to happen? God will draw people to you because of Christ in you. Because Jesus said that if you lift me up, 
I will draw all men unto me. He's talking about the cross. It's Jesus who draws. It's the Holy Spirit who draws people. It's God who draws people. You need to put yourself out there, and God, you almost don't have to do it at all. All you have to do is say, I'm going out there. And God will put you in, in, in place of somebody who needs you desperately. Men, all you got to do is be there. That's all you got to do. How many times have you and I struck up a conversation with somebody and ultimately the discussion moves to God, religion, church, all that stuff? That is your opportunity to share the gospel. Not only do we, not, not only do we need men of integrity and in men of instruction and inspiration, but let me give you one more. Godly fathers are men who implore others. Listen to what Paul says. He says, we encouraged, we comforted, and we implored. We pleaded with you. We urged you. I would never suggest that you and I push people because that can be the flesh. But there is such a thing as a pleading, an imploring led of the Holy Spirit towards someone to urge them to make the right choice, to make the right decision, to choose God. There are people out there who are probably close to, but just need that extra loving, compassionate, comforting nudge and moved in the right direction. We need men like that. Men who can seize the opportunity and use it to plead to men to move in the direction of God. I suspect that there are men right now, right now, as you and I sit here, who are fixing to make a definitive, life-altering decision. And they are sitting there thinking, who could I go talk to before I make this decision? How do I know that? Because I've been there. Because you've been there. Who can I go talk to before I make that decision? And so we need men who implore. And here's the final one. This one is interesting, but I hope you take it in the right way. Godly fathers are men of impact. Men of impact. I wish I had time to list the men who made an impact in my life. I'm thinking about an old cowboy who used to come and teach our pastor down in McAllen, Texas. He didn't know a lick of Spanish. And he was desperately trying to learn Spanish. And so he had this old cowboy. When I say old, he was up in his 80s. And uh, his name was Wayman. He's passed away now. Wayman was an Anglo guy. And you can ask Sylvia, he could teach me a thing or two about Spanish. He was fluent in Spanish. Sadly, my pastor never learned Spanish. I mean, he just never took his lessons seriously, so he never really learned Spanish. But Wayman was a guy who had the ability to impact your life. He was an encourager. And he lifted people. And that man made an impact on my young life at the time just simply by the way he carried himself. He was a godly man. He was a, he was a godly Christian and a bold one at that. He made a difference in my life. He told me something that is not really deeply profound. 
But he said this to me. He said, Carlos, when you know something is true and right, don't you ever back down. That's not profound. That's not <laughs> deep. But that made an impact on my life. If you know something is true and right, don't ever back down. We need men who make an impact. Listen to what Paul says here. We encouraged and comforted and implored each one of you, watch this, to live worthy of God. To live worthy of God. Why? Who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Think about that for a second. You and I get to participate in the kingdom and the glory of God. We get to be part of that. No wonder Paul had an impact on these people. He gave them a glimpse of what they were a part of. It's not just church that we're a part of, and that's a blessing. That's great. That's good. We're part of the body of Christ. We're part of the fellowship. But we're part of the rule of God over this earth and everything else in it. You're part of that. And one day, when Jesus comes back with all of his... We will get to participate in that. So, while that is going on, I want to encourage you. Live worthy of God. Is the life that you are living right now a life of integrity? Is the life that you are living now a life of instruction? Or of inspiration? Are you imploring others to live for God? And are you making an impact in the lives of people? There are days when, as a pastor, I have to do funerals. And funerals for me are not fun because you have to say goodbye to people. And over the years, as we've done funerals, we've, we, I say we, families have said goodbye to loved ones. And I've been in, in funerals where everybody in the family, including myself, have wanted that funeral to be over rather quickly. Because the man lying in the box did nothing positive for his family. Nothing good. Nothing right. Out of respect, they came. But that was it. If anything was said, it was short and quick. But I've been a part of funerals where they've been a joy to do. Because People in the congregation, if every person there would have said something about that individual in that box that day, we would have been there all day. That's the kind of impact some people make. You and I have the ability to make that kind of impact. Not for your glory, not for your honor, not to brag, not to show off, none of that. To make an impact in the kingdom of God you and I have that kind of ability. Men, I want to challenge you today. Be that kind of a father. Be that kind of a man. Be a godly man. Be a godly man. I'm going to ask you to bow your head as um, our instrumentalists and, and Carol come and Isabel as they come. Just bow your head. Men, if there is something in your life today First of all, if you are that kind of a man, if I just described you, praise God. Thank you for being that kind of a man. If there's an area in your life where you need God to do something, 
Make that commitment today. Make that decision today. Change, not by your power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Let him do that. I said to the first service, all you have to do is surrender. Lord, I need your help. I need help right here in this area. You can't be a godly father and a godly man if there's not a relationship with Jesus Christ. That must come first. And the only way to have a relationship with God in heaven is through Christ. And that's by acknowledging that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We can't save ourselves. But that Jesus Christ paid the full price on the cross. And the Bible says that on the third day he resurrected. And he ascended into heaven. And he is going to come back. The Bible also says that if you believe that with your heart and confess it with your mouth, you shall be saved. If you'll trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, he'll come and he'll save you. If you've never done that, you need to do that today. I urge you to do that today. If you're watching online or you will be watching this message and God speaks to your heart, I would encourage you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ right now. You say, Pastor, how do I do that? Let me urge you to say something like this to the Lord. The prayer in and of itself won't save you. It's your confession and your sincerity before God that will. If you will say, Father in heaven, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I know that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And I repent of my sin today. I ask you to forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and I believe he rose again on the third day. And I put my faith and trust in him alone. If you prayed that, I would urge you to text LIFE to the number that's on the screen. Just text LIFE and just say, Pastor, I prayed that. I meant it with all my heart. What do I do next? If you do that, we'll, we'll respond to you will help you walk with Jesus. If you're here in the auditorium, you can do the same thing. You can take that card in front of you and do that. If you simply want prayer in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to stand and sing and we're going to come and I'm going to be down here. If you need prayer, if you made a decision, you need prayer about it, I'll be glad to do that. Father, I thank you for this day. And I thank you for your word. Now, Father, as we sing this song, if, if there's someone here today who needs to make that decision, they're that close, I, I pray, Lord, that you would lead them there. Help them to fill out the card, Lord. Help them to write that message. And if someone needs prayer, Lord, and they need to come to this altar, would you draw them, Father, in Jesus' name? Amen. Come.